presentation. Uh, Bruce has a presentation, and I, I also have a presentation. But before we do that, what I'd like to do is get a little bit of a feel for which years people travel. So I'm going to call it a year, and if you travel during that year, you can't stop. I want to see just how far back we can go and how far forward we can go. So let me start with 1985. If you traveled in 1985, stand up. All right. How about 1984? Did you travel in 1984? Oh, the same group. How about that? Gluttons for punishment. How about 1983? Woo! <laughs> 1982. 1982, just stand up. 1982. Good grief. You're the only one in 83 and 82? 81. Huh? Who is it there in 81? No one in 81. How about how about 80? Alright. How about 1979? 1978. Wow, good grief. 1977. <laughs> 1976. Theo, would you call some space? He needs a little help, Sandy. 1975. historical moment 
The three of us standing together. Well, this is brutal. 57 years ago, we three roomed together at CLBS. 57 years ago. We have not been together in the same room for a half century. Wow. We roomed together at the, in the penthouse suite at the plush, luxuriant Cooper Arms Apartments complex. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to suggest that the Cooper Arms wasn't quite as plush and luxuriant as I say, but I must tell you that we, it cost us $65 a month. That's not $65 a piece, that's $65 a month. $21.66 a piece. <laughs> In, in architectural terms, you know how they, this, they describe buildings, architectural, as early Normandy or early Tudor? The plush luxuriant Hoover Arms was early desolate. <laughs> hey, Gary, is that where you stuck the knife in the hand here? Uh, we're not going to get into that momentarily. <laughs> But this evening, because this is such a special evening, and because we haven't seen Larry for all this time, Jack and I purchased a little gift for Larry. Jack, if you hold the present, don't let Larry get close to me. Now, Larry, let me tell you what is not in the present. In, in the present, we do not have a small box of starch. And so tonight, you don't have to worry about Jack once again slipping into the bathroom while you're putting your bath water in and pouring the box of starch in. It is absolutely amazing to me, Jack, how one small box of starch can make every hair on a guy's body stand straight up. Scratch me, scratch me! <laughs> but it's not in the in the present, Larry. There are no balloons in the present. So you are not going to be able to fill those balloons with water tonight and step out on the hush luxuriant. Uh, balcony, you know the one that was right under the sign that said fire escape? <laughs> and you're not going to be able to throw those balloons at passing cars. <laughs> now some of you may suggest that for Bible school students, standing up on the balcony and throwing water balloons at passing cars isn't exactly the way that Bible school students should act. And that's true. But you have to remember that this was the first quarter that we were at the Bible school. <laughs> It must have been, I'd say, six or eight weeks before we became holy. <laughs> Larry, what is not in the bag is a blender. So you are not going to be able, during your health food uh, period, you are not going to be able to take rutabagas and eggplant and everything and grind it together into one of the most awful tasting things I've ever seen. And so this evening you are not going to be able to say, it doesn't taste good, but your body's happy. <laughs> So what is it? Jack, why don't you give Larry the present? Why don't you give Larry the present? Because those of you who have heard the story have never heard it with the three protagonists standing in front of you. <laughs> Our first quarter in the Bible school, we weren't really good chefs at that point. We basically 
we basically uh, existed on as cereal and grilled cheese sandwiches and French toast and the occasional noodle monstrosity that Jack would whip out. Noodle strudel. Noodle strudel. <laughs> we were so pleased that Jack brought a canned ham home. How did you how did you get that ham? Uh, the ladies I worked with felt sorry for me. <laughs> So Thanksgiving Day 1961 came, and the three of us gathered in a, I should say, huddled in our little kitchen, which was a very small kitchen, and we had to make a decision. None of us had ever made a canned ham before, so the question became, do you take the can, the, the ham out of the can first and put it in, or do you put the can in the oven? Had an opportunity to make one small mistake in life. <laughs> so we put the can in the oven. <laughs> at 350 degrees. I don't know, maybe it was an hour later, so we decided to look at our little treasure. And it looked a lot. Have you ever seen a, an official NFL football? <laughs> One before Tom Brady got his hands on him. <laughs> That's what it looked like. Well, we, we had a point, you know, we had this, this feeling that the next morning our classmates were going to look at the front page of the LA Times and it was going to say, three Minnesota teenagers dead in unique Thanksgiving Day kitchen accident. <laughs> We had, we had the former wrestling captain of the Minnehaha Academy wrestling team there. So very quickly, Larry and I got out, and Jack came around. Now, this, we have a difference, I think, in how this happened. So I'm going to tell it my way. So, so Jack took a knife, went around the we were all on the corner, and he stabbed the can. You want to see what happens to a fully loaded can with a small pinprick size hole? We put it in because we didn't want to lose the pork juice. Up and down the wall. phenomenon can continue for 20 minutes. <laughs> Before we made the ham, we had decided, let's splurge. Let's go to the store. We didn't have a lot of money. Let's go to the store and get some pre-made biscuits. So we put the pre-made biscuits in, you know, the, the one of those rolled, rolled things. Were in there. So it's very well, things have got to be pretty active around there, and we forgot about the rolls. <laughs> you ever seen what happens to a two-hour-old big roll? <laughs> so Larry, enjoy the hand. <laughs> Just one final thing, Mary. This is a cook tab. <laughs> and it's got to be refrigerated. Please give it to my sister. <laughs> now, it seems to me, Mr. Stumble, that you have a presentation to make. Okay. ago and asked if I would uh, make a little presentation tonight, and as shy as I am, it was difficult to say yes, um, but I'm glad to be here with you and to do this. He asked me if, if I would tell a story or two about memorable people, and he happened to mention Ava. <laughs> so Tom, really, this is Gary's fault. Gary. Yeah. Um, then I got to thinking, you know, why Tom? 
Why not care? <laughs> so what I've, what I've decided to do tonight, um, and I really don't know how long this is going to take, but I'm hoping to be able to semi brief because it got me to thinking about this is going to come out all wrong. It got me to thinking about men <laughs> and LEM. LEM guys that I kind of grew up with. And so I've got to start with Gary. And uh, one of my favorite memories of him, and there are plenty of them, we, uh, we had a meeting, just Gary and I, and he offered to take me out to lunch. And oh, that'd be good. He'll take me to be dying or something. Took me to McDonald's. <laughs> And uh, we ordered separate meals, and I had mine, and I was unwrapping my cheeseburger. And, and, uh, and I heard this funny noise, and kind of went, <laughs> and I looked up, and he was already done. <laughs> Literally, I, his hamburger was gone. And I, I was so impressed with him, I've never seen anybody eat food that fast. <laughs> and maybe it's because of eggs and those guys, I'm not sure. But it was a Incredible! If you've ever eaten lunch with Gary, watch it, because it's gone. <laughs> now, uh, Gary helps. When Ron and Gary were roommates, you had an apartment out south of town. Did they come? Larry. 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 All right. Uh, yeah, we had a, you have to understand that I didn't have enough of that guy. So six years later, we roomed again together for about a year and a half in an apartment. Larry, can I, can I just tell the story? <laughs> Larry had a parrot, a parrot named Hagar. Hagar the parrot. Parrots are one-person birds. Hagar loved Larry. Hagar hated me. I still have a scar on my back from where Hagar latched on me, and I had to whack him off with a uh, with a broomstick. Is, is Hagar still with us, Larry? Absolutely. What a shame. I was uh, visiting at Gary's apartment, and uh, the phone rang, and somebody was on the phone asking Gary if he would be interested in being a youth director at his church in North Minneapolis. And Gary said, no, I don't think I would be interested in that, but there's somebody here who might be. And he kind of went, Bruce, are you interested in being a youth director at church? <laughs> no, no. It was Robin Carlson, uh, Pope Luther, North Minneapolis, and I went to work for him. Roger was very persuasive. About a year and a half later, Roger came to me and he said, Bruce, would you be interested in going to work for LEM? It's my boss. <laughs> and I said, what are you saying? Well, would you like to go to work at LEM? I said, absolutely, I'd love to do that, but I would have to leave here. I know, we'll make it. <laughs> we'll make it. Well, so Gary introduces me to Roger. Roger gets me into LEM. And I was very familiar, obviously, I'd already traveled, and it was kind of a dream job for me. And uh, I went to work for Dick Clowder. We had a wonderful time together. Shirley was there, it was great. They put me in a little room and I was in charge of itineraries and helped out a little bit of training. Uh, I thought that this was going to be a team that would last for 10, 15, 20 years. Eight months later, Dick takes off. He leaves, literally going to the wilderness. <laughs> to do the rest. <coughs> All right, so thank you, Mr. Clowder, for that wonderful opportunity. <laughs> and it really was. I want to go back a little bit. This isn't chronological at all. I'm just talking about guys that have been important to me in connection with Ilium and CLDS. Now, Tom. Tom Agam and I worked together for a while at CLDS, but I remember distinctly the first time I met him uh, some of us guys were it's in LA, we're out on the sidewalk in front, I believe we were in front of a grocery store. And uh, a couple of my buddies came, came up and said, We want you to meet somebody. And it, this skinny little Mexican kid. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, This is so great. All these people from Minneapolis and St. Paul and all around the country. And, and please forgive me, all those white kids and, and 
South LA. And here's this little Mexican kid. He's going to start covering the school. We're getting multicultural. This is great. It was Tom Ayam. <laughs> yeah, totally fooled me. Full blooded Norwegian. <laughs> hey, boy. Okay, that was my first uh, episode with Tom. Bruce Johnson. Uh, 1970 Gospel Crusaders, we had been on the road for about a half an hour. Train camp was done, we got on the bus, started off, and the bus breaks down. And one of the gals, bless her heart, and she might have been right for all I know, but she, she started preaching to the crowd on the bus. You know, this is just a sign from God that we've got to get right with the Lord. And we've got to get, we've got to get down on our knees and pray and ask for forgiveness and get our hearts right with Him. All of which is true, of course. <coughs> but out from the back of the bus comes, oh, piffle! <laughs> <laughs> and I was shocked. Of course. But if we could use that word more often, I think we'd be better off. <laughs> We did pray, the bus got fixed, and we went on our way. But that was one of my first memories of Bruce Johnson. Uh, Burnell. Uh, Burnell and I traveled together with a few other people on the 1971-72 Living Dimension. Uh, I'm going to get back to him in just a moment. I've written a couple of books. Uh, one um, that I started on about 20 years ago is a confirmation curriculum. The other book that I wrote has never been published, nor will it ever be. Um, but I wrote it after we had gotten done traveling in 1972. And I just want to share a bit of a dedication with you guys. The, the, the book was about travel. It was about getting ready to travel on a team, and what it meant to be a team member, how we did that. And I have no idea where it is, but I do remember the dedication. This won't be a perfect uh, rendition of it, but a bit of a paraphrase. Because the dedication was very important to me. Um, here's how it went. For Pam, who sang the best. For Charlie, now Chuck. But for Charlie and Gracia, who fell in love. For Lynn, uh, for Lynn who was no yes man. For Denny, who always seemed to smile, no matter what. For Karen, who played and played and played and played. She worked for more teams than anybody I could think of. And for Burnell, who swallowed the fly. <laughs> Transfer to Wisconsin. Good memories, brother. Good memories. We're singing away up in front of the church in Grassford, and all of a sudden, Burnell is like... <laughs> that made it come around to my hand. And I was ready to dedicate you for There it is. Sam McKinney. Um, awesome. You, I don't know if you noticed, but when I went up front, Gary uh, called us, a couple of us up front when we were upstairs. And I walked over to, to Sam, and, and, it, and I was trying to talk to him, but I realized he was singing to me. He was singing a song. And I, and I had to listen a little more carefully. I had a very bad hearing. And um, so I leaned in, he's singing, Oh God of the South, Son of the Rain. I thought I was going to cry. Because that was my song, and Sam said, that he sings that song all the time. Uh, Sam, you are so influential in so many lives. We are so delighted that we can see you here today. The word mafia got mentioned, and this is my little presentation, and it's really just a symbolic presentation of so many different memories and you guys aren't going to get this, the 70 Crusaders, Mike, and I just found out recently that not everybody liked it that we did this, but we have a picture somewhere of a bunch of us guys with hats, and if you can believe it, gold or yellow Nehru jackets. <laughs> and uh, so I'm going to give some hats. I, 
I bought Walmart out the other day. And uh, Bruce Jackson, come on up here. Let's do this quickly. Don Christensen, Lauren. Yeah. Hey. Yeah, and I really don't have enough, but uh, uh, there he is. Yeah, you can turn around a little bit. People can take a little bit. Here you go. You get one right now. Gary. Let's, let's assume the pool is right here, guys. There you go. Has to be one black hat. <laughs> And I can't, I can't actually physically do what I was doing in the picture. <laughs> yeah, I'm supposed to be on my knees, I can't do it. <laughs> You can keep the hats. I don't. <laughs> Thank you very much. So Bruce, aren't you guys I think we should do some singing, don't you? Yeah. Now, I asked Sam, and he said, you know, I, I'm a little bit tired right now. And besides, we've got lots of other piano players here. And so I'm going to, before Rosella starts to play, I'm just going to make a brief announcement. Rosella Nelson didn't actually travel with the team, but she traveled, she does travel to this day with a very important team member of ours, Don Kerman. And some of you know, some of you don't know, that Don, uh, many years ago, had a very major stroke. And um, Don and, and Rosella together wrote a book called Stroke Survivor, A Story of Hope. It is a dynamite book, uh, and it talks about the struggles and the joys, and uh, Don and Rosella uh, have a bunch of those books here to give away. And where do you have them? They're in the back of the sanctuary. They're in the back of the sanctuary upstairs. Um, if, you, if you're the first one to get up there, get it, because it's a really, really fine book. Rosella plays by ear. I love that. So she, she has said, let people ask for songs we can sing and we'll sing them. So let's, let's, what would you like to sing? Okay? It only takes a spark. It only takes a spark. <laughs>
that song reminded me of something. I don't know if you have looked at what was on this. Uh, oh, you know, before we do that, let me just uh, acknowledge a couple of people. Is Nancy back there? Yeah. Get Nancy out if you would. Oh, there she is. Nancy, would you just wave for a second? Nancy Johnson Nelson was a member of the, uh, the youth group here while I was the youth director. And uh, as I mentioned, she and her husband, Stan, have spent the last, last 35 years in Christian camping at the fifth largest campgrounds in the nation. There was a time when Nancy would prepare meals for 800 campers at a time. Uh, she is an extreme. She's not doing quite the same thing any longer. Now she just raises thousands and thousands of dollars for the camp. But when I, I didn't think that I wanted to be in the kitchen here. And so I called on Nancy, and she has done just an amazing job. And if you enjoyed the meal this evening, could you give Nancy a
sat in a room, in a classroom, and he out unfolded the plan for what he thought would be a great opportunity to, for outreach. And he called it the Gospel Crusaders. And we, we chose as our theme verse, um, Romans 8, 37, but in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us so. And some of you haven't noticed that there were these in the middle of the, of the uh, tables, but I just want to read it. The original Gospel Crusaders theme verse, 1962. <coughs> in all of these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us so. Romans 8, 37. Dear Father, we thank you for calling us to serve you on LEM teams. For emboldening us to share our faith in you with others. For bonding us in love and purpose with our teammates. For allowing us to witness the power of your spirit in action. Walking through us, for walking through us, for walking with us through good times and strengthening us in difficult ones in years since. For gathering us together now to renew friendships and share life experiences. Revive us again. That's great. Let's sing that song. Uh, Amen. Uh -huh. 
four buses. This is so much fun. Let's keep going for a while. You when you pray. Let's say something about this. This is the song, one of the songs I most remember. And I was asking Sam just a few minutes ago whether they, whether you all continue to sing it when you would be. What song? Yes. Oh, uh, uh, when, when, when you pray, will you pray for me? Oh, the close of the day. Not the close of the day. What I remember about it, I, I remember at least the three large teams that I was with, I remember that it, when on, on the morning that we would leave and everybody brought uh, people back together and we all stood on the grass and we, uh, we I would look up and I would see team members uh, with arms around young children that they'd spent time with and holding hands. And then we would come with the family and begin to sing the song soft, softly and we'd all join in. And uh, I thought we would finish this evening with this song. But in order to do that, we have to learn it first. So let's learn it. We're going to conclude this evening with a song. But somebody say this.
I, I don't really quite know. Uh, there's so many things in my head right now, in thoughts and what to say. Um, Put your background I, first. Yes, I'll, I'll give a little background. Um, <clears throat> so I'm a Timothy story. Uh, I was raised in the church since I was a little girl and heard about Jesus uh, since I can remember. And very grateful for that Timothy story. Um, and went to Lake Cronus as a little Kurt. Uh, my mom especially and my grandmother were very influential in my life uh, growing up. Went to Gold Valley Lutheran College, uh, which closed in 1985. I was, uh, I was there right out of high school, 82 to 84, as a music major. Um, Met a bunch of uh, buddies. We, we got a, a band together, which you do in college with a bunch of guys that love music. And we went on uh, uh, the road for a year with Luther Youth Encounter from 84 to 85. 80, 80, uh, 85, I was heading to a Bible school in Montana, and all of a sudden I met a, a pastor by the name of Pastor Don Barron. Some of you might know that name. He's a Missouri Senate Luther pastor um, who said, Kurt, we need a youth director in Honolulu. And I said, Lord, send me. <laughs> Lord, I will, go. I will go. So off I went to Honolulu from 85 to 87, served this LCMS church. Uh, very much was influenced by youth with a mission there in the islands. Um, and I went then to Seattle LBI uh, from 87 to 89, was looking at a missions degree, ended up doing a youth and family ministry degree. That's where I met uh, Jean Wallstrom. Did she have to leave? No, she's best there, right back there. Yeah. So uh, she was my life group leader. <coughs> Wonderful two years there. And uh, in 1989, I came back to the Twin Cities, and I was sitting at a wedding reception here in the Twin Cities, and a gal said, you know, our church is looking for a youth director. And I said, oh, which church is that? She said, Trinity Lutheran in Minnehaha Falls. So came here in 89, was here for six years, and still music was a big part of my life. I started traveling with three other guys, or two other guys, uh, put a, a music group together called River. And in 95, we went full time and traveled for about eight years full time doing music ministry. And when we kind of uh, slowed our schedule down, uh, I had my sights on seminary and uh, went to Bethel Lutheran and a Baptist seminary. Um, it was good, good school, had a great time there. And was there for uh, six years, got my MDiv through their Monday night program, 7 p.m. Did an internship um, at uh, Luther Church of the Cross in Southern California. And then came back to the Twin Cities in 2008. Uh, was an associate at St. Paul's Evangelical Lutheran. Same DNA of Trinity. Um, and had a wonderful six years there. And then for the last two years or so, we've been doing a house church plant. <coughs> Out of our home in Roseville, so we get together and we are the church. We are the church, right? Yeah. And so that's been kind of my snapshot journey. But a few years back, I was sitting at a, a, a convention down in Denver, and Peter Chernus, the former director, said, You know, Kurt, I'm going to be taking this call to Gig Harbor, Washington. I think you should be our, our new director. And I said, Well, I said, I'll pray about it. And so I did, and it just seemed like that was where the Lord was leading. And as you know, we LEM, LEM is not what it used to be. It's, we don't have those. I mean, this is just amazing to hear all the stories. Um, and God has those different seasons that come and go for ministries. And we, at this point, are in a place of um, two focused ministries, one of which is called Life Together Churches. And that was really coming out of... Um, uh, Pastor Bruce could tell us, some of you might have known him, he had a real heart for church planting, but also then Pastor Peter Chernus, who is now in Washington, and we have started that ministry called Life Together Churches, and in a nutshell, it's about a passion for equipping people that want to plant churches. One of the things that we know about um, in research today is that planting churches is one of the most effective ways of evangelism and of discipling people, so we were involved with that. And the other thing that we're involved with, more than these two main things, is Pastor's Place. And many of you know uh, Pastor Jim Johnson, who's on our board. Uh, he was at Medicine Lake for many years, and now he's planting a church uh, for a few years now out in California, in Camarillo. And Jim has a huge heart for pastors to get away, to be refreshed, 
and to particularly to just in, equip them and charge them up for evangelism. And so we're going to be having a pastor's place retreat in August up here in northern Minnesota, and we'll be heading to uh, North, Northern California in probably January for another one of those. So we are kind of moving along um, as a ministry. Some people think, well, is LEM still going? And we are, so we cover your prayers. Um, we also could use a couple new board members. We're in uh, search right now for a couple board members, so maybe the Lord will lay that on your heart to be a part of, of LEM. Um, one of the things that has already been mentioned is the books and Jonathan Anderson, such a great uh, addition as our uh, resident historian. And Jonathan had that first book that came out, and, and it's 15 for the first one and 10 for the, the uh, Rise Up and Build. But at the conference this weekend, we're doing it for $20 if you want to get both books. And I think we'll just make arrangements. I will be here tomorrow, but we'll make arrangements to leave some of those. And, and where are you going to be? Where are the books now? The books are upstairs. There's a booth up there. And um, I would imagine we could leave that up. Trinity staff person. Is that okay if we leave sure. the booth up? Okay. You know what? That's where the coffee is. Okay. Oh. Morning. So it's 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 It's, a, it's such a wonderful history of, uh, of the LEM, and I encourage you to get that for your library. I just wanted to mention something, as, as uh, some of you know, it's the 50-year anniversary of when the teens ministry began, but it was, it was 80 years ago this year that, that uh, January 5th, 6th, and 7th, and January 5th was a very, very cold day, and Trinity hosted the first um, evangelism conference here at Trinity. And um, I want to share this text. This was the very, this was the first text that was shared the very first session that morning of January 5th, 80 years ago, as Pastor Conrad and many of the other leaders were gathering to say, God's doing something. And this was the passage from Ezra. I'm not gonna. I just, just want to read it briefly and make a couple comments. So Ezra is crying out to God. And this is part of his prayer. And, and it's in the context of that they have they've sinned. They've, they've grieved the heart of God. And they're coming to before him. And Ezra says, But now for a brief moment, the Lord our God has been gracious in leaving us a remnant and giving us a firm place in his sanctuary. And so our God gives light to our eyes and a little relief in our bondage. Though we are slaves, our God has not deserted us in our bondage. He has shown us kindness in the sight of the kings of Persia. He has granted us new life to rebuild the house of our God and repair its ruins. And he has given us a wall of protection. And we know that our, our wonderful leaders of the LEM back in uh, 1937 as they gathered, they had a heart for renewal and revival within our own churches. For folks that are sitting in the pews that, that needed to connect with the reality of the Lord Jesus uh, being the Lord of their life. And it's certainly to, to find that message going out beyond the Lutheran circles, but we, we had this wonderful revival begin. One of the questions, and by the way, Dick Clowder is on our board. Praise the Lord that Dick is on our board right now. That is such a gift. But one of the questions we've asked just recently is, Lord, is there a season for LEM right now? Because, you know, seasons come and go, and it's okay for seasons for ministries to end. But we really felt like, as we talked about it, is there a reason, would there be a purpose that God would want to use the LEM today to continue that vision of renewal in our church today? And we all uh, very much said yes and amen. Is there not a need today for renewal in our church? And so I would just encourage you to pray for the LEM. Again, we're looking for two or three other board members. If you would have a heart to be a part of, of us as we move forward and pray about vision and decisions and strategy, we would love that. Uh, and let me just ask a blessing over you as, as I close. Lord Jesus, I give you thanks and praise for this time together. It is so sweet, Jesus. It is so sweet to be in this place. We feel your presence here, Holy Spirit. I thank you for every story 
and the stories that come out of every person's life that walk with you. The inspiration, the encouragement, Lord, and the challenge that's before us uh, as we come together to remember, but Lord, we also come together perhaps to be fired up, to be fired up and renewed in our walk with you and to impact our neighbors with the greatest news they could ever hear. That in the cross of Christ we have forgiveness of sin and everlasting life. Oh God, use us. In Jesus' name, amen. This is, this is my old friend, Gene Foster. Now don't use the word old. Oh. <laughs> use the microphone. Microphone? Mike here. Oh. This thing? Uh, this is my old friend, Gene Wallstrom. Careful. Ken, Ken, Ken. No, it's Wallstrom. It's Wallstrom. It is, because okay. I kept Wallstrom because I had the credit rating. <laughs> <laughs> Gene and I traveled uh, in 1963 with Don Flayland and his team to South America. And uh, we've been friends, and we were friends before that, but, that school, right. but we were friends afterward. Uh, Jean mentioned something right now that I thought was really valuable to talk about. She's promised not to take very long. I'm really fast. <laughs> I'm quick. <laughs> um, I just want to also make a mention that what began in terms of the kind of gospel movement, gospel teams, that youth groups are still traveling and still doing things in groups. Um, Tom can talk about it too, but I know that um, for the last 12 years of my active public life of ministry, uh, you know, that was when I got paid to do it, and now I'm paying to do it as a volunteer in retirement. Um, but, you know, uh, our church sends out three or four youth groups every year for certain projects. They go places, they do things, and they talk about faith, and they learn about Jesus. And I guess the, the, the kind of a, a team that we were used to in terms of articulating our faith and sharing testimony, they do perhaps uh, their, their growth in their faith articulation is a little different in the experience, but the relationship which they have now is all cross-cultural because we live in a different world. And uh, the, multi, the, the diversity has been something that I've begun to see and really relish in our youth at, out of our church because they come back and they're changed people because they've grown in their faith, they've learned more about Jesus, they've grown to love Jesus and realize God's alive in the world and doing great things. And uh, there's a respect that they have learned about other cultures. But, but that idea of a team movement is still happening and it's still going on. And, and certainly that kind of movement uh, and it changes lives. It changes young people's lives, and forever they're, uh, they're changed. Uh, my husband and I were privileged to work for the ELCA in Global Missions. We were missionaries in East Africa and Tanzania for the last 12 years uh, teaching there. And um, we had many, many groups come out. Because now youth groups just don't go to, you know, they just want to, they go more than Fer Fergus Halls. They go, they, you know, they go beyond Fergus. They go, Maybe all the way to Bemidji, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, you know, they're coming to Tanzania, they go to Mexico, they go to Costa Rica, they go all over the place. And, and the world has changed, but they're still talking about Jesus. Young people are still growing, and there's still teams, and the whole team movement is still very much alive. All right. A little more singing. What do you want to sing? Try to
playing Norwegian solos named Harold Halfson. He had been studying at the Seattle Bible School. And um, our friend, our mutual friend Don Flavin, brought us together and said, you guys ought to go and travel together. And so for the first year that I was with the LAM, Harold and I traveled everywhere. We traveled throughout the nation. Because part of what we wanted to do was to spread uh, the influence of LEM types of experiences elsewhere than where the LEM had been historically. So over a year we did, uh, we did many miles everywhere and then each day we would talk with more pastors. I, I think we talked with something over 250, 275 pastors, many of whom had never heard of the LEM before. And it opened the door for teams and over a period of time uh, we were in a lot of different places. But as Earl and I traveled together, we took that song, and I, I would tell a story. I, I can't tell you that I remember the story fully, but the idea was it was about a, a prisoner who had done some very bad things, was in jail, uh, and a pastor who continually came to talk with him. He didn't want to talk with the pastor for a long time, but the pastor came back again and again, and ultimately, uh, Joel became a Christian. And, and at the end of the story, I, I would say, and if you listen really carefully, you may just be able to hear Joel in his cell. And Harold will start singing this. Do it one more time. Take off your coat, if you have a shepherd, take off, and build yourself a hole. 
know what says the Lord, I know what you think I'm The Lord said, no, it gets some sturdy gopher wood. You never know what you're going to do until you try it. You know, 50 cubits high and 30 cubits wide. No, I'm not in the eyes of the Lord. No, I'm not in the eyes of the Lord. There she is, there she is, Lord. The Lord said, No, hurry up and get aboard. Take of every creature, a he and a she. And of course, this is the Lord, and the whole family. No, it's no, it's something. <laughs>
fellowship, friendship, and faith. What a wonderful time you have given us. As you've called us through the years together, you've blended us and bonded us together. Strangers are now friends. We thank you for the privilege that we have to walk in the steps of Jesus, to go into the world with the gospel, the best news possible. We thank you for all the stories that we've heard today. They're your stories, Lord, and for this we give you thanks. We pray now, Lord, that you would continue to bless us and keep us. Make your face shine upon us and be gracious to us. Turn your face toward us, Lord. Give us your peace. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. amen.